Following the attack on Fort Sumter, the North and the South both had to ready their armies for battle. The North and the South had vastly different accommodations when it comes to leadership, militaries, resources, and strategies. The North were led by newly elected President Abraham Lincoln. Many doubted Lincoln's ability to win the war because he was an inexperienced leader and he lacked a military background. However, Lincoln listened to his generals and was a dedicated, patient, and intelligent commander-in-chief who learned the importance of military strategy. Lincoln closely monitored telegraph communications from the front and would directly give orders to his generals from Washington, D.C. He also had the ability to enact necessary measures that would unify the nation behind the war effort by way of a strong central government. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus, allowing him to jail suspected Confederate sympathizers and quickly neutralize potential threats. The South was led by Jefferson Davis, the newly elected president of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis was a veteran of the armed forces and brought a strong military background with him into office. Davis was initially incredibly popular with the Southern people, which gave him the political capital to make decisions with wide support. Davis was also an experienced politician who knew how to work with his colleagues to achieve political victories and get things done. However, the Confederate Constitution emphasized states' rights and state sovereignty, which meant that the central government of the Confederacy was weak and inefficient. Individual states frequently denied any request that Davis made in the name of the central government, which hindered the war effort and made it difficult for the Confederate government to fight the war effectively. The Union Army held a significant size advantage over the Confederate Army. With more cities and urban areas, the Union had a much larger population than the South. This meant that the Union had a greater reserve of volunteers and enlisted men than the Confederacy. The Union also had more ships and a much more organized Navy than the Confederacy. A naval advantage gave the Union supremacy on the high seas and allowed them to initiate a blockade of the Confederate coast. While the Confederate Army had less manpower than the Union Army, it held a significant advantage in military leadership. Many of the nation's most distinguished officers such as Robert E. Lee and Thomas Jackson, committed themselves to the Confederate cause when their home states seceded. Military service was a strong tradition in Southern families, which meant the Confederacy had a large pool of talented officers to lead their forces. Most importantly, Confederate forces were motivated to fight for their families, their country, and their independence. Comparing themselves to the colonists of the American Revolution, Confederate soldiers believed in the justness of their cause and were determined to fight hard for everything they held dear. Resources for the North and the South also varied drastically. In the Union, years of industrialization and development led to a significant advantage in technology, manufacturing, and supplies for the Union. A greater number of factories in industrialized Northern cities meant that the Union could mass produce weapons and equipment with a larger workforce. The North also had an advantage in food production and the more sophisticated banking system in the North meant the Union had an easier time raising money for the war effort. The Union also had a much larger and much more efficient railroad system, which allowed the government to quickly move supplies and men to locations where the Union Army needed them. The North's extensive telegraph system also gave the Union an advantage in communication during the war, allowing messages to be dispatched quickly to more populated and remote areas. In the Confederacy, due to their agrarian economy, the southern states that seceded and formed the Confederacy were not as industrialized as the North. With fewer major cities, the South did not have many factories, and with a smaller population, the Confederate workforce was much smaller than the North. As a result, the Confederacy had a difficult time mass producing weapons, equipment, and other supplies. Southern plantations were configured for cash crop production, which meant that the South could not produce as much food to feed the soldiers and their civilians. Southern states had less than 50% of the mileage of railroad track that the North had, and their allotment of railroad cars was vastly inferior. This made it extremely difficult for the Confederate government to ship men and supplies to remote battlefields to meet the needs of the military. The Union's main objective in the war was to bring the Southern states back into the Union and reunify the country. The Union strategy to win the war had several components. First, the Union would use their Navy to conduct a blockade of Confederate ports to prevent the South from receiving supplies or trading their goods to generate revenue to fund their war effort. Second, the Union would use the Army to gain control of the Mississippi River, which would cut Southern supply lines and divide the Confederacy in two. Third, the Union would seize the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia. The Union's path to victory was much more difficult than the South's. 
To win, the Union Army would have to invade the South, defeat their army, occupy their territory, and subdue a population of millions of hostile people. The Confederacy's main objective in the war was to fight to win recognition as an independent nation and to preserve their way of life. The Confederate strategy to win the war had two components. First, they would use their smaller military forces to fight a defensive war and hold on to as much territory as possible on, until the North down. tired of the war and sued for peace. Next, the Confederacy would use diplomatic relations to convince Britain and France, nations that relied on the South's cotton, to recognize their independence and pressure the Union into ending the war. Southern military leaders and the Confederate government were willing to take risks and change their strategy to a more offensive plan to win the war. To win the war, the Confederacy knew that they'd have to overcome a superior force with superior supplies, and so invading the North would have to be a possibility. From the outset of the war, the four border slave states that had resisted secession and remained in the Union, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, proved important. First, by remaining in the Union, these four states added their soldiers and supplies to the Union war effort, which hurt the Confederate cause. The Confederacy needed men and supplies much more than the Union did. However, each state also held vital strategic advantages in the war. Missouri helped the Union control parts of the Mississippi River and shipping routes to the west. Kentucky controlled the Ohio River, which the North could use to resupply the middle of the country. Delaware was very close to the major city of Philadelphia, which was now protected, and the Union capital of Washington, D.C. was located in the state of Maryland. With Maryland loyal to the Union, Washington, D.C. was protected, and the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia was just 100 miles away, which was pivotal. Also, important railroad lines that ran through Maryland and connected to Washington, D.C. were protected, which kept the flow of supplies running. By the summer of 1861, some 112,000 men had joined the Confederate Army, and 187,000 men had joined the Union Army. Most volunteers were from small towns and farms, and the average age for a soldier was 25 years old. However, 40% of the soldiers in the war were 21 or younger. The war divided families, pitting fathers against sons and brothers against brothers. It was not uncommon to see brothers from the same family join different sides of the conflict and fight against each other. Even the president was not exempt. Abraham Lincoln had relatives from his wife's family fighting for the Confederacy. The men who rushed off to war were eager to fight and earn glory on the battlefield as heroes of the war between the states. When the war began, each side expected a quick and easy victory. They would soon learn that it was to be a long, costly, and bloody war.